Manuel. Hey, Ron, and, and incidentally, Jonathan, I, I really enjoyed your 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 episode on uh, AR, the Art Night Center in the UK. Hearing about your background and, and careers was really interesting. Hopefully, we hear thank more you, about Thank you, thank you very much. Coming. Thank you. Not to get on your own show and compliment you, but. Uh... Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, you're on something I've, I've been wrestling with for a long time, and you, you mentioned it a few uh, on a few episodes of the the long term implications of um, massive government spending. It, it's challenging to communicate or even to understand really um, what those impacts are. the The rec day of reckoning of inflation really has has not happened. You mentioned things like th that sort of spending has destructive, really harmful economic impacts. And I just, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on how to measure, how to identify. You mentioned too, the Fed does all sorts of things to dis distort and hide impacts of inflation, but would, would love to just hear your thoughts on how, how we better measure and understand I the mean, harmful the tragic, impact. The tragic fact is that it's very, very difficult, maybe impossible to actually measure it, right? Be, um, because we don't have an alternative universe in which the Fed didn't do what it did, it's hard to tell what would have happened. Right. And so because the, the effects of the Fed's behavior much more have to do with what investments happen versus what investments don't happen, have to do with the fact that the economy grows slowly because so much money is spent on consumption rather than investment. It has to do with the fact that uh, a lot of companies that should go bankrupt and free up their capital and reallocate it and, and stop wasting our time, in a sense, by selling us products, um, time and money and effort are still in business. I mean, this crisis, the amount, the number of zombie companies today that are in existence because the Fed has bailed them out repeatedly, really since 2008, is, is stunning. So how do you measure the, 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 the drag on economic growth? of companies that should not exist, right? The companies that are running are, are barely paying off their debt, only can pay off their debt because interest rates are so low. And during 2000, 2020 could only pay off their debt because the Fed basically bought their debt, bailed out, bailed them out in, in, to a large extent. Um, what, what are called zombie companies. I don't know how many they are. There's, there's probably, uh, you know, hedge funds that, are, that should be shorting them, but also probably afraid to short them because they won't go bust as long as the Fed bails them out. So, you know, it, it distorts things in so many ways. It's, it's so difficult to tell what could have and would have happened. But that's the main thing. So it doesn't pop out. For, and, another example, right? Without the Fed, I believe that prices would be dramatically lower today in almost everything that we buy. So the purchasing power of your dollar would be significantly higher, particularly, uh, you know, things that are imported, particularly things uh, that, but, but generally things that, that are in the marketplace. So our standard of living would be higher. But again, how do you measure that versus what? Because our standard of living is still increasing. It's just not increasing very fast. And I'm saying it would increase really fast. And people go, yeah, but how do you know that? That, that doesn't, right? So there's no measure of it. And, th and that's partially how they get away with it, with it right? Because if people could actually, if they had a mirror that showed them what the world could be like, they at least some of them would desire that world and, and, and would fight against it. Yeah, that, that's a really helpful way of thinking about it. I, I guess even on a simpler, and that, that all makes a ton of sense as well. Even on a simpler note, I mean, CPI, if, if the quantity of money is increased, chasing the same number of goods, you would expect to see price inflation increase. I mean, so all the economic effects you're describing make a ton of sense, but why is it that, the, is CPI not a good measure of price inflation or are there other? Well, first of all, first of all, if, if short of uh, the Fed increasing the money supply, prices would drop, then the increase in the money supply might be just raising prices enough to keep them stable. So why is CPI zero the ideal? CPI is consumer price index, right? And there are lots of other measures. That's just one measure, but you, you can you can you can measure inflation. You know PCE, which is the uh, uh, 
something cost. Anyway, I can't remember. But, but there are lots of, lots of these measures. But if those were going to drop and, and you're increasing money, then maybe they're stable because, and I believe that given China's entry into the world economy in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, that prices should have dropped dramatically because productivity, global productivity, which is what matters in a globalized economy, global productivity went up dramatically. And in a world in which the dollar is the reserve currency, you can print a lot of dollars as global productivity is going up significantly and not have a, not drive prices up because productivity is driving prices down faster. So, um, so the, the fact that it's flat is one. Second, since the financial crisis, at least, people have not really been engaged. The velocity of money has been low. Most of the money sits in bank accounts. Most of that at the Fed. So a lot of the money the Fed so-called created just sits in reserves. It, it, it never entered. Um, so you've got, so now I think it's going to be different because, so here's, here's a thought which is, comes out of modern monetary theory, which I, and I hate to give them credit for this, but there is a certain truth to it, right? I'm speculating here, but see, see if this makes sense, right? In a world where interest rates are close to zero, I'm also interested in what Jonathan thinks of this. In a world where interest rates are close to zero, bonds are money. They become money in a sense money because you can easily monetize them because there's government bonds, right? Because there's no risk and no inflation and no, there's no interest rate risk because the, the interest rate is as close to zero as possible. So they are almost money substitutes. So is it inflationary if the Fed buys bonds? You could argue that by buying bonds, it's replacing one form of money with another form of money. And that the real inflation is caused when the government runs deficits and creates the bonds, not when the Fed is buying. So in a sense, QE, by the Fed just buying up a bunch of bonds that were already in distribution, didn't increase the money supply in a traditional sense because they were just replacing a money substitute for money. Now, if bonds are trading at 10% interest rate, then they're not money. They're not money substitutes because they've got risk, there's inflation, and they're getting income. But when they're trading at below 1%, right, which your treasuries are, right, what's the difference? Right? I could go to the casino and, and hand in a government treasury and get cash and, 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 and you know, get chips and, and reverse. And people do that all the time. They use their bond portfolio as collateral for all kinds of investments and stuff. So the money's there already. What is really increases the, 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 the quantity of money is massive bond printing. And, this while, and uh, bond issuance. And while the government has been running deficits over the last decade, those deficits have been nothing as compared to what it's just done over the last year. Isn't this so essentially... I would, say, uh, I would say the current stimulus, the four trillion, maybe going on five, maybe going on six, we'll see if what Biden gets. This is truly inflationary, not what the Fed is doing, but what the, what the, what the central bank is doing because it's creating new money by creating these new bonds some of which are being bought by the Fed and being turned into cash, but most of which staying bonds, but with interest rates close to zero, which the Fed again is doing, they're basically money. And, and, and that, that I believe is going to be inflationary. That's why I think this time you are going to see a spike in prices. Global productivity also is not increasing at the same rates it was in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, or even over the last two, 10 years because China's slowing and Africa hasn't picked up yet, although some increase in productivity yet. And, and there was some increase in productivity in Asia, but it's just not on the same scale as it was. So if I had to bet right now, I think this time it will be inflationary. How bad? Hard to tell. Partially because you have to factor in increased productivity in all these other countries, which I don't think most economists do.
I'm sorry, right. Jim, you were going to say something? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, I kept interrupting you. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of uh, what I've learned recently about the Social Security lockbox works. Tax dollars come in. Social Security trust fund literally uses them to buy uh, bonds, yep. which then pays the treasury cash, which that it can then spend on whatever. And all they, all they have is this bond equivalent. Which means all they have is IOUs. Yeah. So the, the, the lockbox at Social Security has IOUs from the federal government. Now, the IOUs are good because the federal government can print as many as they want. But at some point, there has to be a point where the government is going to have to face, the federal government will have to face this dilemma. Either we have hyperinflation because we print huge amount of money or we default on the debt. Now, it's true that these bonds at 0% interest rates are money already. But if interest rates have gone up, which you'd expect them to go up as they, you know, as, as, as they're just pouring in more and more money and Social Security is broke and everything like that, then interest rates are high. Now you're issuing money to pay back to buy the bonds. Now you're creating a ton of new money. Now it's hyperinflationary. And would the federal government default on its obligations? And um, while MMT claims governments that have printing presses don't never de don't have to ever default, that's true. But in hyperinflation is arguably worse than defaulting. Yep. So at some point that happens. You can't tax your way out of this. So uh, uh, Daniel says hyperinflation default or tax. You cannot tax your way out of it. The, the amount of debt they're taking on is so large that who are you going to take the money from? There's just not enough people to take the money from. You could tax all the rich at 100%. You wouldn't get the money you need to pay off the debt. So, And, and once you start taxing, taxing the middle class, I mean, basically, you're giving the middle class money, right? That's what Social Security and Medicare is. It's, it's a, uh, the middle class, uh, the entitlements a middle class redistribution of the wealth. The redistribution of the wealth towards the middle class. So that's why you can't, that's why they're untouchables, right? If these were for the poor, they would be touchables. If these were for the rich, certainly they would be touchables. That's why the Democrats are very smart. Anything you do to the middle class, you can never touch again. So if you want a social program that you want forever, so government has control forever, you do it for the middle class, whether it's a tax cut they always tax, cut, cut taxes for the middle class. They don't care about the poor. They care about their voters, and their voters are middle class. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes that should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up 
you'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.